There's a lot of things that are essential to having biblical community. And the best example I could pay for you is building a house. So, um, with that, I would like to start with foundation. It's important to have a good foundation. Those of y'all that have built stuff, um, especially if it's in uh, the area of construction, or you built a model house or a building, you know how important that is. And so you start with a good foundation. Now, um, for those of y'all that do have your Bible, I'd like y'all to turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 24 through 27 to start with. Um, but for those of y'all that don't, it's going to be up here on the screen. So Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat the house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who has these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, within these two verses, um, within these few verses, we see that Jesus makes it very clear to us that you must start with a good foundation, and the good foundation being Him. And so He's wrapping up His Sermon on the Mount, ending with this talking about a foundation and how critical it is. And if you don't have a good foundation, it ends up determining your future. So whatever you found your life upon, is going to determine what your future looks like, whatever you found it upon. That means if 20 plus is founded upon by anything else but Jesus, it might be the place to be at that time. It might be a great community of friends, but it's not going to last. It won't have permanence because only in Christ is there permanence. We worship God who is eternal, and when we build on a foundation that's eternal, it lasts for eternity. It lasts for eternity. Now I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verses 11 through 12. That will also be up on the screen for you as well. So Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 12 says this. It says, And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so as we start thinking about building a foundation and then building a house and putting all the structure together, I want you to think about these spiritual leaders here as the builders that help to make the walls sturdy. So if you were to think about 20 plus in this community and leaders in this church, you think about people with these giftings and these skills, those who are prophets, uh, apostles, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers who help to pour into and equip the church as it's being raised up and being built up. And uh, just to have an idea of what these different leadership um, skills and gifts are, I have a definition for each of these. Don't worry, I, I, you can find these later. Um, so there's a picture. There you go. Boom. Uh, building up the house. And then the next slide here says this. Apostles are those who want to share, uh, want to start new ministries, to reach places the gospel isn't preached, and raise up and develop leaders. And so you might be an apostle in here. Maybe that uh, resonates with you. Um, you might be a prophet, somebody who receives a word from the Lord for others, and to hear, uh, receives a word <laughs> from the Lord for others to hear and is that a typo? Yeah, there's no, there's you speak boldly without fear. Speak you speak boldly without fear. Okay, that makes sense. It just didn't make sense in my head. Um, but it makes sense. Okay, an evangelist. Those who clearly and effectively communicate the gospel of Jesus to others. You might be an evangelist. Maybe that's your thing. Maybe you're totally not shy. Um, for me, that's a struggle. Honestly, it is really a struggle. Um, so that's not my primary gifting. Um, there might be somebody who's a pastor or shepherd, uh, those who desire to care for and guide believers to grow. Or maybe you're a teacher, somebody who is gifted in communicating and clarifying the truth of God's word to others. And don't worry about writing all those down. So you, can actually, you can actually find those on the website, which is where I pulled them from. It's called Spiritual Gift Test. 
www.spiritualgiftstest.com, spiritualgiftstest.com, if you want to look up more and find out more information. I, I think it's really, really helpful for all of us to know how we're wired and how we can serve. Because really, that's kind of the point I'm going to drive home towards the end, is how can we serve? Because we all have a role in biblical community. And so God has set apart these leaders who have natural, the natural desires from God to build up community. Now, let me ask you a question. Before I keep moving on, why do we come to church? What are, what are some ideas? I'd like to get some feedback from you all. Why do we come to church? What are some reasons? And I'm, I'm not going to say any of them are wrong because this might be the reason. Yeah, Aaron. To obey God. We're, we're called to be in community so we can go to community. Good, good. Okay. Yeah. To worship God. To worship God. Yeah. Uh, to spend some time among other people who are trying to live God's word as opposed to the rest of our week when we're around lots of other people who aren't. Very well put. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Okay. Any other reason? To be spiritually fed. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> the main reason, and I'll explain this a little further, um, the main reason we come to church is to be Quit. So all of your answers are correct. None of them are wrong. But if you were to think about every single reason as to why we come to church, the main reason is to be equipped. And there's an example I shared about about a year and a half ago in 20 plus, and it was this. Sometimes we look at church like we would a buffet, when in actuality, really, church is a training ground. Now, now, let me explain that a little more. Um, some people come to church, and really their main focus is to get a good word from the pastor. Um, and that's it. They come to the church, they sit down, they want to hear a good word, they're counting on the pastor, and that whole week they've had to plan a sermon, and they want to get a good word to go home with, and that's really it for them. And what ends up happening is if you look at church that way, you see it like a buffet. And if you went to a buffet, you would go in and you're ready to pick your food, put it on your plate, be full. But what happens about six hours later? Or maybe even less time, depending on how much MSG they put in your food. <laughs> you get really hungry, right? You want to go back. You want more. And it's never enough. But the church is more like a training ground. Because when we come to the church, God feeds us, but he does more than feed us. He also takes the Word of God and equips us so we're ready to go out into the world to be around the people that really don't care about God at all. Right? That's why we're here. We're coming here to be equipped. And that's what the leaders of the church do. The leaders of the church equip us and send us out into the real world. But they don't do it on their own strength. Because we can stop there. We can lay a foundation of Christ and we can have our leaders built up. But what makes the church beautiful is the Holy Spirit. And so here's the last piece of this beautiful house that's being built here. And I want us to look at Galatians 5. And don't, don't worry about turning there unless you have to. Um, but Galatians 5, verses 22 through 25. And we're going to read about what you uh, would know as the fruit of the Spirit. And it says this. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, is peace, is peace. Patience is kindness, is goodness, is faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit. Against such things there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And it says, if, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so this is what makes the church and community beautiful, is when this happens, this naturally takes place. And so when you come to a place and you don't see this happening, it's really hard to fit in. It doesn't matter how little or how much you love Jesus. When you don't see peace and joy and patience and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and all these attributes of the Holy Spirit just naturally uh, being a part of community, it's not, it doesn't fit you don't, you, don't, you don't feel like you're part of a body. And just like a finished house, there's a little picture I have here, just like a finished house, when the Holy Spirit is present, and when you have a foundation of Jesus, and people are building up the body of Christ. 
you have a beautiful home. You have a place you can call home. You have a place you can call home. And so, um, when you have the community that's founded on Jesus, you have leaders that are building up the body of Christ and equipping and sending, and whose beauty, this is the beauty of the body of Christ is the Holy Spirit just naturally being there. You find a home and you find biblical community. This all sounds good, but Matt, I, I'm really interested in you know, how does this apply to my everyday life? Like this is some good stuff, this is good food for thought, but where does this actually apply? So the sad truth is, if we look around this world, uh, we live amongst the people uh, where there's a huge spirit of apathy. Um, and what I mean by that is that there's a lot of people who don't feel like they have time for biblical community. There's a lot of people who don't think biblical community really does anything for them. So they don't care about it. And we, as most of us in here probably uh, amongst the generation of millennials, um, we're probably very informed. We're probably, uh, in some ways, strongly passive around people. Um, and in other ways, uh, we're really highly autonomous. And what I mean by that is that we've learned more information than we know what to do with. Um, we have been raised to accept all people and ways of life and to even celebrate them. Um, and we also, as millennials, are spread out all across the city and yet really nowhere to be found in the church. And because of the way our lives are, we busy ourselves, try to climb the ladder of success, and we end up coming home to find that we never can attain what we've really been dying to find. And it's ironic, because if you were to go to a bookstore, we have more self-help books. And if you were to take a personality test, you would think that that would tell you all you ever need to know about yourself. And you try to find hope in the world, and it never really gives you your identity. So. We need biblical community now more than ever. Because so many people are fighting and striving to find out who they really are. And they're going through all these hoops. And it does nothing. And we live in a generation that doesn't know who they are. And they're trying so hard to find out by being active and taking these tests. And it's just an endless cycle. And so we can try to go at it from that perspective and we can step away from the church and try to do things on our own, but what we, what we find is that we, we just run into walls. We don't know our purpose. We don't know what we're supposed to do. We don't know how God fits into everything. We don't know why the Bible's important and why churches are around. We just don't, we don't get it. We really don't get it. And so we need biblical community to help us bring us back to who we are and also, more importantly, whose we are. Now, another reason why it's so critical, and for those of us here, this might be something we wrestle with every time we're around those in biblical community, whether it's a Sunday or even a small group during the week, is fighting off the lies of the devil. It's really easy, easy and we become very prone to judging things. Um, while we're in the church. And so there's different lies, whether it's lies of preference. Maybe we don't like the guy that's teaching right now. We don't like the way he sounds. Uh, maybe, of course not me. Uh, maybe we don't like the way worship sounds or the music that they play. Maybe we're listening to lies of preference while we're in the biblical community. Um, maybe we're fighting off lies of autonomy. And what that means is... Um, you know, we don't want people to truly know us. We can still be autonomous even when we're present because we're not opening up because of fear a lot of times, honestly. Um, because we think back, well, the last time I let somebody really know me, this is what happened, and I don't ever want that to happen again. And sometimes we believe that lie that if we're autonomous, that things are going to be better. And other times, there's lies of self-sufficiency. Like, I don't need to hear this again. I, I, I understand this. I've read this passage before. I get what you're saying. And so we rely on knowledge. We rely on our own strength. 
and we think we can do this on our own. And in fact, sometimes we just think, well, you know what? I don't even need the Holy Spirit. I don't need other people speaking in my life. I'm okay. I'm saved. I'm eternally secure with God. I'm self-sufficient on my own. And sometimes we believe those lies, and we need biblical community to bring us back to the truth. And here's a great passage in Acts chapter 2 we can think about and examine as we, as we see how does my life line up with biblical community. So just listen to these words from Acts chapter 2. I'm reading from verses 42 through 47. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, and the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now this is a great, great passage we can always go back to and examine and think about, all right, so I'm in a biblical community. Is it like that? And am I giving myself to serve like they serve? No community is perfect. No community is ever going to be perfect. But are we working on these things? Are we going back to what the church is founded on? Are we serving one another? Are we breaking bread with one another? Are we getting to know each other? Are we praying for each other? Do we care about one another? Um, it's, it's easy to be here. And it's easy to believe those lies from the enemy. Man. When we truly, truly get to be part of the biblical community, we care about all these things. And we remember the foundation that Christ has laid for us. And we remember that we're supposed to equip one another. And we're supposed to um, naturally uh, be the fruit of the Spirit in our life. That's naturally supposed to be a part of the way we live as a biblical community. And when we forget that, we forget our identity. We forget who we are. And we forget whose we are. And I want to challenge you guys, and this is a little demonstration I want y'all to be a part of. Um, everybody that has a phone, would you hold it up real quick for me? All right. Everybody that has a phone. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, keep holding your phone up if you have the ability to call. Great. I hope so. <laughs> keep holding your phone up if you have the ability to text. Okay, hey, great. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> Keep holding your phone up if you have social media of some sort. Great. Okay, you can put your phone away. Um, so, <laughs> I want you to think about this this week and moving on forward. It's a real, real practical thing. All the stuff that I just talked about, how can you use a simple device like a phone to help serve one another, get to know one another, hang out with each other? Be involved in one another's life. Simple things, simple things. And to be honest, I'm guilty of this too. There's so many people I have in my contacts, and I don't just shoot out a message saying, hey, how you doing? Hey, how can I pray for you? Hey, you want to get a group together and go out to eat? We don't have to wait on Stacy to set up an event. <laughs> um, one of the best things you can do is invite people over to your home and play some board games. One of the best things you can do is have uh, everybody bring their own food. That way it's like $7 on you because you just bring chips. <laughs> it's not like that, right? Uh, that's, it's so easy. And that can help to start uh, moving forward, creating a more uh, tangible biblical community. Because you can be here and not be in line with what Acts chapter 2 talked about. It, it's, it's, it's hard, don't get me wrong, it's, it's hard to stay consistent. Um, but even somebody like me, who needs a lot of self time because of some introverted uh, tendencies, um, I, can, I can go into my phone, schedule out time, and even say, hey, I'm willing to spend uh, two to three hours with these people and then get them, kick, them, kick them out of my house. Um, but man, you, you're, you're, <laughs> Your whole life will change once you open up to people because we were made for community. We were made to be known. And if you even think about God, our maker, before he made anybody, 
community existed amongst Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are made in the image of God. Therefore, made for community with God and community with one another. So it goes back to our, our identity. If you want to simplify everything I just said, it just goes back to identity. Do you want to know yourself? Do you want to know others? And do you want to know God? Really simply put. And um, last thing I want us to do uh, in the next few minutes before we close is think about this one question. Don't, don't worry about going to it, but I, I want you to think about this question. <laughs> well, there they are. <laughs> um, I want you to think about this question. It's the third question there, which is, what are you going to do about what you heard? What are you going to do about what you heard? Not, what are you going to think about what you heard? What are you going to file away back in, in, in your file cabinets in your head about what you did? But what are you going to do? What's going to be at the forefront of your mind? What are you going to plan into your calendar on your phone? To say, hey, you know what? This person came to mind. I'm going to put it in my calendar so I don't forget about them. It's not because I'm a jerk. It's because I, if I don't, I'm going to forget. I do care about people. I love God. God made me that way. But what can I put into my calendar to actually start serving people? Who can I text to show that I'm actually willing to be biblical? others? How can I be around others so we can establish biblical community? So, uh, let me pray for you guys, and Stacy's going to come on up.